Hello, everyone. It's Clay Jenkinson. This podcast introduction to today's program, it's on Henry Wallace. You probably don't really know that name. He was one of the four candidates for the presidency in 1948. That's when Truman defeated Dewey uh, for the presidency. Truman was being elected in his own right, although the whole country, including everybody, around him, and his wife, too, Bess, thought that Truman could not win that election, but he did. And, of course, you've all seen the famous photograph. Dewey defeats Truman, and Truman grinning um, <laughs> about as widely as it's possible to grin. Uh, Jeremy Gill is somebody I've met many years ago in Kansas. He lives out in a part of the world that I have a special fondness for, western Kansas. He's at uh, Hayes, which is a uh, hundred and some miles away from where my daughter grew up in Wallace County, Kansas. I've been to Hayes and Fort Hayes State a number of times, and you go through it all the time when you're leaving western Kansas for Topeka or Wichita or Kansas City. I want to really recommend these two books, Dewey Defeats Truman, the 1948 election and the Battle for America's Soul by A.J. Bame. I'm going to try to get him on the program. He also wrote The Accidental President, uh, Harry S. Truman and the Four Months That Changed the World. That's the one I particularly recommend. And I came at it uh, via J. Robert Oppenheimer. And what makes uh, Henry Wallace interesting is that he uh, agreed with Oppenheimer that our only chance after Nagasaki was to share atomic secrets with the Soviets, with everybody, to try to forge levels of cooperation and trust and that if we didn't do that, a Cold War could be not only calamitous, but it could lead to the end of the world. In other words, it might not be our happiest choice to uh, befriend uh, the Soviet Union and to share our secrets with the Russians. But if we didn't, the world could end. And Henry and Henry Wallace seems to have held something like the same view. So I find that all fascinating. And uh, Wallace had been assigned by FDR to have some oversight on the Manhattan Project. Whereas when Harry Truman became president on the afternoon of April 12, 1945, he heard about the Manhattan Project for the first time. He knew nothing, absolutely nothing, about the coming of atomic devices. So it's a story filled with irony and loss, I think, uh, and a fascinating character. You know, there are many fascinating people who never became the president of the United States. You could do a book. I'm sure this has been done, in fact, on extraordinary people who should have been president. Adlai Stevenson, for example, or Henry Clay, for that matter. People that should have been president of the United States and for whatever reason never achieved that. So I recommend those books. It's an interesting conversation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Jeremy Gill for contacting me. If you have thoughts about programs we should do or subjects we should uh, explore, please uh, let me know. I'd be fascinated uh, to hear from you uh, and take your suggestions seriously. Um, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm expanding the program. I'm trying to reflect on America's 250-year experiment, you know, beginning with the Declaration of Independence. I've got that era down pretty well. I have some weakness on the Civil War era and Reconstruction. I mean, I've always felt that if you get too close to the Civil War, it's like a vortex. It will take you down into a into a black hole from which you will never emerge. And so I know something about that era, particularly about Lincoln. But I've never been a Civil War historian. And then I pick things up again with the Indian Wars, the Native, the wars against Native Americans in the West. Then I become stronger when we talk about Theodore Roosevelt and all that followed. Uh, but there are whole gaps, giant holes in my understanding of this experiment, how we got here. And I'm trying to figure out what you have to understand in order to make sense of us at 250. And, and one of those questions is you know, uh, our place in the world. Jefferson was an isolationist. Isolationism has been an important streak in American life from the very beginning. Uh, we're seeing it again now. I mean, one of the things that, that distinguishes Donald Trump is that he is effectively an isolationist and um, wanted America to come home and stop involving itself in, in futile and unwinnable wars abroad. Uh, whether he was able to make the case for that very well or, or do much about it is another question, but that would be a question for any president in American history. So I'm fascinated with the isolationist streak in our history. We were sort of drawn into the world's arena in 1917, 1914 to 1918, the, the Great War. The United States was a latecomer. Wilson campaigned in 1916 saying he'd kept us out of war and would keep us out of war. He didn't, of course. He had already planned to get us into the war. And between the wars, the United States returned to its isolationist, uh, its sort of its fundamental mission, which was an isolationist one. Um, but then FDR slyly uh, carried us into World War II, and of course probably would have gotten us into it anyway, but the Japanese uh, precipitated our participation on December 7, 1945. And then there was an isolationist streak again after the war. 
and we're in one now. So that's an important, you know, what is America's duty and role in the world's arena is a really important question. And I think we're having a pretty incoherent national dialogue, a national conversation about this at the present time, we should be thinking about it much more seriously, and particularly with the resurgence of um, the Russian Empire under uh, the direction of, of Vladimir Putin, but also of uh, China rising. So these things are going to be a huge uh, challenge to the United States in the last 60 years, 70 years of the 21st century. So that's one thing I'm looking at. Uh, another issue is race, of course, and Henry Wallace was a true liberal on this question, far in advance of even Harry S. Truman, a believer in racial equality. And he, the other third-party candidate uh, standing in the 1948 election uh, was Strom Thurmond, uh, the Dixiecrat, he created the Dixiecrat Party to keep the national government from meddling with apartheid in the American South, uh, you know, legal segregation. He didn't do very well, uh, but he uh, he started a trend in, in, in Southern politics of finding ways to resist the two parties as they attempted agonizingly to integrate the country and end legal segregation. So that's another theme in American life. Native Americans are a huge theme for me. You know, I like to say that when Columbus bumbled into the New World in 1492, it was all natives all the way out from the tip of Canada to the bottom of South America. Uh, this is a world that had been largely left alone uh, by the rest of the world, undiscovered, at least according to their own idea of discovery. And suddenly uh, Europe came and the rest has been what might be called the Europeanization of the Western Hemisphere at, at enormous cataclysmic loss for indigenous peoples. And now there's a resurgence of national conversation about the plight of Native Americans and their rights and their lands and what happened and what can still happen and should happen. So that's a theme that I find fascinating. And, and to get ready for my, my tour of the country in the wake of John Steinbeck, I want to read books on women in American history, on agriculture in American history, on uh, race in American history, on an environmental history of the country, a labor history of the country, uh, the, the history of cities in America, uh, the history of politics in America, the history of the Supreme Court in America, the history of the American dream, the history of the westward movement. I mean, and on and on. This is my chance later in life to get a second big education I'm planning to take it very seriously. So anyway, this is a program by Jeremy Gill of Hayes, Kansas, about Henry Wallace, who was the vice president in the third term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, dropped uh, for the fourth, um, but he stood independently as a presidential candidate, as a progressive in 1948. Let's go to the program. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this special edition of Listening to America with Clay Jenkins. And today, Henry Wallace. Henry Wallace, Vice President of the United States, candidate for the presidency, controversial figure from the New Deal. I'm talking with Jeremy Gill, who's a library specialist at Hayes Public Library in Hayes, Kansas, also an adjunct professor at Fort Hayes State. Welcome. Thank you, Clay. I really appreciate you uh, letting me be on the air. Who is Henry Wallace in a nutshell? Henry Wallace is a complete enigma of a politician. Um, Henry Wallace is a a scientist, a political thinker, um, a philosopher, and an overall uh, just a fascinating character within um, our American political landscape that really has not been rivaled by many other people. So give us his approximate dates. Sure. So uh, Henry Wallace was actually born um, in 1888 in Adair County, Iowa. Um, he was uh, born um, to a kind of an agricultural uh, dynasty of a family, um, the Wallaces in Iowa. Who we're talking about today is Henry A. Wallace or Henry. Agar Wallace, um, who really took a huge influence from his grandfather um, and kind of was embedded with this idea of like God and agriculture or God and, uh, and land. Um, he really, really took a, a huge uh, influence from his grandfather in that regard. His father, uh, Henry uh, C. Wallace, was an editor um, of, a, of a magazine and a newspaper um, that kind of dealt with agricultural topics, uh, eventually became Wallace's farmer. Um, he was called upon um, to serve as Secretary of Agriculture under both uh, um, uh, Harding and uh, and Coolidge, um, and his uh, his son kind of uh, takes the helm of he, that's kind of the world that he kind of grows up in. So our Henry Wallace grew up grew up in, in the Midwest uh, in an agricultural world. Uh, his father was a political figure who served in a couple of Republican administrations. What was our Henry Wallace's profession besides politics? Sure, and and I should back up here because uh, Henry Wallace is kind of known within the Democratic circle. We'll probably get to that uh, here shortly, but. He, 
his family was a, a very prominent Midwestern Republican. Um, but as something that we're both probably interested in, Clay, is uh, someone like Theodore Roosevelt, who was this more progressive wing of the uh, Republican Party. And that's kind of where his family's wing was at. Um, they were ardent supporters of Theodore Roosevelt. They were ardent supporters of uh, Gifford Pinchot, uh, the, uh, the U.S. Forest uh, Secretary. And they were uh, supporters of the Bold Moose Party as well. But Wallace himself, after he graduated from uh, Iowa State uh, University, he also followed in his father's footsteps and worked for him um, in the uh, newspaper uh, business. His first assignment was actually going all over uh, the West and kind of exploring um, irrigation projects within uh, the Western uh, half of the United States, including my hometown of Garden City, where he, where he stopped by um, to look at uh, flood irrigation, ditch irrigation there. He then is, uh, he gets picked up then by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the, the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. So, all right, 1888 comes from a progressive family, strong interest in the agrarian, uh, family interest in government. He then winds up being the vice president of the United States House. He first, uh, he's picked up um, by Franklin Roosevelt to be the Secretary of uh, uh, Agriculture, and then he serves that for two terms. Um, and then he kind of reshapes that entire uh, that entire department with uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Um, he then is selected um, by Roosevelt uh, to be his running mate for his controversial third term, uh, which people didn't even know within political circles of both parties. They, that was obviously completely unheard of um, to do that, and that he was even considering it. And this actually comes on the heels of FDR's uh, failed attempts to basically do a core packing scheme. Uh, so he had been kind of damaged politically already. Um, Roosevelt's vice president was uh, John Garner Nance, Texas, who was looking to either be president or step back from politics. Um, Roosevelt kind of looked, looked at different people within his party. He was also looking for loyalty. Wallace kind of was a diehard Roosevelt supporter. Um, he kind of him hawed about the third party run, but eventually kind of came out in support of it. Um, then on the heels of, uh, of World War II, this kind of catapulted FDR into being able to uh, run that third term. And Roosevelt chose Wallace to be his uh, running mate in his, in his third term. Uh, FDR first becomes president in 1932, displacing the one-term president, um, Herbert Hoover. Uh, he stands for re-election in 1936. He's resoundingly re-elected. Then he does something that has really never occurred previously in American history. Um, he wins a third term as president in 1940. John Nance Garner, his uh, vice president from Texas, famously said of the vice presidency, it's not worth a bucket of, he actually said piss, but it has been usually uh, changed to a bucket of spit. But he certainly realized that the vice presidency was a sort of a dead end. So how did FDR come to choose Henry Wallace to be his, his VP in 1940? There was uh, several different candidates that were kind of up for um, consideration. Um, there was much more liberal, and um, even Henry Wallace becomes, for, th further throughout his political career, becomes more and more progressive and uh, liberal, but there was other candidates that were kind of being considered some other New Deal type people, but they thought that maybe Wallace could carry um, kind of more of that Midwestern um, of area that they kind of lacked in, in some cases. This is also uh, after they had resoundingly beat someone like Alf Landon from Kansas, the governor, Kansas governor, um, but Wallace kind of was that, that touchstone of being able to uh, tap into the American heartland um, and speak to an electorate that, that, that the Roosevelt administration. Yeah, you know, I'm going to skip forward, I'll come back, but skip forward to 1940 when he stands for the presidency um, and he's in a, a fairly large... In 1948 there are a number of people who want to be the president of the United States, including of course Harry S. Truman who came in through the back door at the death of FDR on, on April 12, 1945 and became an accidental president, wanted very much to be re-elected in his own right and was famous. Uh, Truman defeats Dewey uh, in 1948. By that time Wallace was considered to be too far left, too radical, maybe even socialist in in some circles, maybe even thought to be a communist sympathizer. You said that he grew more progressive over the course of his life. Did FDR know in 1940 how radical a figure Wallace was? I don't think so, because I FDR himself um, kind of stayed a, away from that a little bit. And I, I think Henry Wallace, Henry Wallace didn't do the same kind of politicking that FDR did. Um, he was much more of a thinker. Um, I think he thought very hard about what he believed in, um, and he came to those realizations later on. Um, but Wallace does this thing where, you know, he starts out kind of, you know, obviously in a Republican family, uh, switches sides um, to the Democratic Party, but that's, I think, several years into uh, FDR's administration, so he was still a Republican, so even Democrats uh, within Roosevelt's uh, rankings didn't particularly trust him uh, because of that. But he, uh, Wallace's viewpoint was he was a, he was a proponent of peace, a, an extreme opponent, a proponent of peace, and I think that's what led him to that more uh, left-leaning uh, side of the uh, uh, of the political spectrum. And what got him into trouble
scuffle with uh, Truman and then in the post uh, and after he had left uh, uh, Truman's administration and then subsequently ran for office himself is that he thought that you could warm up basically to the Soviet Union. Maybe you could play into more of a peaceful approach instead of this ramping up of the Cold War. He had visited uh, the Far East where a lot of historians think that he probably was a little uh, led astray by uh, the Soviet government um, and showing them kind of the, the highlights of their country, maybe not so much the poor parts of their country as well. Um, he was for the uh, the common man, whether that was in the United States or around the globe. So I think that kind of pushed him into those uh, realms of, of seeing being seen more as a left wing uh, progressive um, a person in the in the political uh, areas of, of Washington D.C. I know Clay that you're interested in J. Robert Oppenheimer. This is also kind of a time when Oppenheimer's uh, is being called into question um, by his loyalties to the United States, and and Henry Wallace also gets caught up um, deeply in that in that era of the, of the first Red Scare. So then back to FDR. So um, John Nance Garner uh, makes it clear he does not want to be the vice president in 1940. Um, Henry Wallace had been a very uh, useful member of the New Deal team, uh, particularly distinguished himself in agricultural recovery. This was a time when the Dust Bowl had devastated much of the Great Plains, um, widespread poverty, uh, lots of farms and ranches were literally ruined, um, and the New Deal came in to try to stabilize American agriculture and to stabilize the grass. Uh, Soil conservation was born at this time. Uh, This was a very important time for the U.S. government to intervene in what was a man-made national and international environmental catastrophe, the Dust Bowl. Henry Wallace performed admirably in all of that. Good soldier for the New Deal. But now, John Nance Garner is leaving. Uh, FDR chooses him. They win in 1940, in spite of the fact that there was some concern about whether FDR should have a third term. Uh, But he manages to to win that election. So now uh, Henry Wallace is the vice president of the United States. By the time the 1944 election comes, where Roosevelt stands for an unprecedented fourth term, a couple of things, uh, Jeremy. One is FDR was not well. In fact, FDR was dying. I don't suppose he would have put it that starkly, but we know historically that he was dying. Everybody had to know this, that the chances that he would live till 1948 were slender, and he might be incapacitated even if he survived that long. It would have been very easy for FDR, who had many other things on his mind, this is the end of the war, to just go with what he had, to stay with Wallace. If FDR had died in office, as he did in, in April 1945, whatever else is true, Wallace was an insider who would have known how to proceed. He was well-versed in government. He knew the inner workings of, of, of Franklin Roosevelt's administration. Why didn't FDR just leave that alone when he had so many more vital things to think about in the fall of 1944? So it wasn't actually totally up to FDR in making that decision. So FDR, like you said, was very ill at this time. He had a lot on his mind, probably knew that he was dying. Um, he had always kind of had this understanding that due to his paralysis, that he could be incapacitated at any time in his political career, that he had kind of been reborn, um, that he got in a second chance. Um, he wasn't sure what was going to happen, but of course he was. He had fallen very ill. Um, he had actually gotten uh, very sick prior to this, and they didn't think that he was going to pull through. He kind of miraculously did uh, pull through, um, but this time it looked way more grim than it had ever before, had ever before in his uh, political career. Um, Roosevelt leaves, um, you know, uh, to go overseas, and he tells uh, his aides, he says, "Well, I just hope that the, I hope the old I hope it's the old team again." And what he means by the old team is he means the very few uh, New Dealers uh, that are still in uh, an office, like Francis Perkins, um, those those types of, of New Deal uh, people. And so it kind of left uh, Wallace feeling kind of uh, in a weird state of, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the Democratic uh, uh, National Committee and also Roosevelt insiders wanted to dump uh, uh, Wallace from the ticket. They thought he was uh, way too much of a wild-eyed, a wide-eyed, uh, kind of a radical, or just didn't fit in with the, with the political establishment at the time. So FDR did not play a significant role in this, you're saying. He had other things on his mind. He didn't advocate for Wallace, uh, but others in the Democratic Party, others in the administration wanted Wallace to be dropped. Roosevelt would do this thing where he kind of played both sides of people. Um, he would play people off of each other a little bit too. And his response was, if I was the one voting at the Democratic National Convention, I would choose Wallace. And that was kind of left at that. He had also privately talked about uh, selecting uh, uh, William O. Douglas from the Supreme Court to be his running mate, as well as uh, Harry S. Truman, possibly uh, from Missouri. Uh, it goes to the convention um, and Wallace is basically not blindsided, but basically 
dumped from the ticket, despite his popularity within the overall National Party. Um, he was not as popular within the own rankings of the Democratic Party, but he was still fairly popular without within the uh, the, the country. Um, Harry Truman is kind of seen as this consensus candidate um, that could take the helm um, during that convention, and he is ultimately selected. Uh, when we come back, I want to ask you more about the time when Wallace was the vice president for four years. What sort of a vice president he was? I'm talking about Jeremy Gill of Hayes, Kansas. Uh, we're talking about uh, one of the most extraordinary political figures of the 20th century, now mostly forgotten, Henry Wallace. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to this special edition of Listening to America. I'm talking with Jeremy Gill, whom I have met in Wildest, Kansas. I have roots in western Kansas. My daughter grew up in Sharon Springs. I want to ask you about Henry Wallace's time as vice president. So for four years, between 1940 and 1944, some of the most momentous years in American history, he was the vice president of the United States. What sort of a vice president was he? Did he make enemies? Did he have any role other than what most vice presidents did in those days, which was ceremonial? Sure. Um, so Henry Wallace kind of reshapes the uh, the vice presidency. Um, prior to this, like you said, his uh, his predecessor, John Nance, gave the very famous quote about what he thought about the uh, vice presidency. And it might just been of a combination of one, Roosevelt was a very, you know, there was no government a agency that he probably probably didn't think should be expanded. Um, he was a very large uh, government kind of guy. So it might have been a combination of that as well as entering uh, World War II. But Henry Wallace is given a lot more duties uh, than has been previously assigned to uh, other vice presidents. One of the ones that is probably the most uh, significant and interesting is that he uh, oversaw the uh, the Atomic uh, Bomb Commission. Roosevelt didn't have very many scientists within his ranks. And despite Henry Wallace being a uh, plant breeder, plant scientist, um, knew uh, some animal husbandry, and had a, a bachelor's of science. He was basically the only connection to science within the political uh, arena at that time uh, under Roosevelt and the cabinet. FDR encouraged uh, Wallace to take the, the lead um, in, in overseeing the Atomic Commission, and he shared a lot of the same views as many of the scientists who came to sort of regret or had this uh, ambiguity over uh, the, the, the Atomic Commission. After it actually had detonated, uh, Wallace said that he had felt like he he was kind of almost disappointed that the that the thing went off because um, he just knew how much had changed uh, after that point. So yeah, during uh, Wallace's uh, uh, tenure as, as vice president, um, he's, he really oversees um, a lot more than most previous vice presidencies and probably kind of set the stage for uh, future vice presidents and their roles uh, within uh, federal government. Yeah, so let me stop you there, Jeremy Gill. I mean, it's so interesting. So Wallace understands the Manhattan Project. He's overseeing parts of it. Um, he knows that there's going to be an atomic bomb if, if, if the tests are successful. He develops misgivings about it, as did many others, including, of course, J. Robert Oppenheimer. But when Harry S. Truman becomes the vice president uh, in 1944, he does not know that there's an emergency effort to build an atomic bomb before Adolf Hitler can get one. He learns of the existence of the atomic bomb project, the Manhattan Project, for the first time. He had been a United States senator, whereas the other vice president, who's been dropped by the Democratic Party in 1944, was fully aware of what was going on and would have been probably in a much better position in the spring and summer of 1945 to understand what it meant and, and whether we should use it and if so, in what way. So it's a double irony, isn't it? It's one of those great historical conundrums. And I think, I have to say, and I want your opinion on this, Jeremy, I think FDR and the Democrats were fundamentally irresponsible in nominating for vice president at a time when it was clear that FDR was not going to survive a second term. A person of limited political scope, and he suddenly has to go to Potsdam to sort out the post-war situation. He has to decide what to do about the atomic bomb and whether to detonate it. He's faced with the failure of FDR at Yalta to stand up to Stalin on the question of Eastern in Europe. I think it's a, an incredibly strange and irresponsible thing for the Democratic Party and FDR to have done. With them dropping Wallace on the ticket, I think it had, I think the Democratic National Convention got way more involved than the idea of what was best for probably the country and the inner workings of a a monumental shift in the in how the globe was going to be divvied up. Um, I think there was a lot of people probably within the Democratic National Convention that even though FDR clearly was sick, clearly 
clearly probably wasn't going to make it through his fourth term. There was this belief that, well, he's been president for what, 12 years. Um, we, you know, surely he'll pull through. Surely this is the same old, same old. And I think that they made a huge miscalculation of understanding that this was not the same old, same old election. And uh, the secession planning was very poor on their part. Um, I mean, you could argue what a Wallace presidency would have been like. Um, you know, it probably, probably would have been a lot different, um, especially with shaping the Cold War possibly. Um, but like you said, to throw a guy uh, that knew absolutely nothing about the, the huge decision that he was going to have to make a, and throw that basically at him is kind of unheard of. I mean, I can't even imagine the feeling that you would have. They always say that Harry Truman just basically went home and ate a turkey sandwich and went to sleep. Uh, he probably had a, you know, a possibly mental breakdown or a panic attack. Like, wouldn't we all? Like, oh, good luck. Uh, Wallace at least would have understood what the technology was being built, um, whether he would have decided to drop it. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of speculation of that. Historians probably believe that he probably would have still chosen to do it, but maybe they would have done gone about it differently with uh, telling Japan. You know, obviously we don't, we have absolutely no idea um, if that would have happened or not. Um, but yeah, to throw someone in that had no connection really to the administration and even not even just the, the atomic bomb, but just uh, kind of knowing probably where FDR stood on uh, the inner workings of the world um, and being at those conferences, it was probably kind of a weird, uh, it was a weird weird misstep of probably with the Democratic National Convention to pick someone completely out of that realm. But every president in my lifetime, especially since uh, Jimmy Carter, has made a big deal about their vice president. That This is not just going to be a ceremonial office. We're going to give them actual things to do. We're going to meet every week. Uh, they'll have a portfolio. They'll be essential to the work of the administration. And that sometimes that's more effective and sometimes less. But today, the orthodoxy is the vice president should not just sit around and, and go to funerals. Back then, it was the opposite. Back then, the vice president had very little to do, and nobody really understood. The founding fathers had, had kind of wrestled with what, what, what should the vice president do except sit around. They finally gave that person the presiding role over the U.S. Senate um, and to break ties in, in Senate votes. But that was it. So the vice presidency, as we now understand it, is kind of an invention of the last 40 or 50 years in American political life. So we get it that they weren't thinking along the lines that we think along. And yet, it does seem crazy that there was no advance planning for what comes after FDR should he not survive his fourth term, especially at a time of international crisis. I mean, this was maybe the most critical moment of the 20th century, and the United States was, at this point, the most critical player, uh, along with the Soviet Union, in the most critical moment of the 20th century. First of all, I want to defend Harry Truman. When he came in, he said to the reporters, have you ever had a load of hay drop on your shoulder? Well, of course they hadn't. They're not Midwestern farm stock, but you get the point. Uh, it was like a cataclysm. It would be like a ton of bricks being dropped on, on your shoulders. And he understood that. He said, pray for me, guys, the reporters. And, and it was clear that he felt that he was in over his head. In fact, he turned out to be an extraordinary president of the United States. He handled uh, the four months following the death of FDR with great um, political savvy and command. Uh, his confidence grew. He stood up to Stalin at Potsdam. He was not afraid of Winston Churchill. Um, he turned out to be a really extraordinary president of the United States, although he wasn't necessarily thought so at the time. Just speculate for a minute. Uh, Henry Wallace stays on the ticket. FDR dies when he did. We don't know whether Henry Wallace would have dropped the, the atomic devices over Nagasaki and Hiroshima, le leaving that out for the moment. What kind of a president would he have been, do you think? So Henry Wallace kind of alluded to what a president that he would want to be. And I think that's where the controversy comes in on if he would have taken over. Um, he wasn't like any other political figure, let alone within the uh, the cabinet, um, within Roosevelt's administration. He had a very wide um, interest. Um, like I said, his probably his main interest in the post-war era was peace. Um, he thought that this was kind of like the great reshaping of the world, which it obviously was. He really sought out to be more of the peace guy, like that you could negotiate more with someone like Joseph Stalin. He came later to regret that. Um, he later called the Soviet Union like the great you know, evil empire. Um, but at the time, he thought there was, there was you know, the Soviet Union had been beaten down, um, which they had been. Um, this was the time that we could uh, prevent something like this from happening again. Um, while other people within both political parties, the uh, Democratic Party and the Republican Party, um, were pushing for, you know, you know, varying degrees of how to confront uh, Russia or the, or the Soviet Union. And Wallace was not as interested in that. And he was more interested in, in uh, negotiations and talking um, with, with, uh, with all, all of these nations, Either 
either A, you end up in a situation where a lot of the bulk of the Cold War is avoided and probably in a pie in the sky situation, or, you know, uh, Joseph Stalin is Joseph Stalin and probably doesn't care who he's uh, talking with. And, and they might have completely overrun uh, way more territory than, than we would have expected, um, which what, what, what ended up happening. So, you know, it's very hard to say on what a Wallace presidency would have been like because he wasn't like any other <laughs> character, you know, that probably would have gotten into that post. Um, sometimes when people run, their ideas are much different than when they become in office. It might have not looked much different um, than what we see now or what we saw after that. Um, there's more progressive or left-wing thinking type people like Oliver Stone who believe that, you know, that was the great miss of the 20th century. Uh, whether that's true or not, you know, that's just up for total speculation. You know, that eminent historian, um, Oliver Stone, who muddled the yes. Kennedy assassination once and forever with that ridiculous film that he made. I don't trust him as, as necessarily being able to read the history of the 20th century in the United States. But I want to go back to this. So Henry Wallace, you tell me if I've got this right. He believed that it was possible to find an accommodation with the Soviet system, that it would be a mistake to get rigid about it, that, that conversation, negotiation was the right thing to do. And maybe it wouldn't turn out, but we had a duty to do this, especially now that we lived in a nuclear era and that he felt that the others, including Truman, uh, were rattling their sabers too much and they were increasing the likelihood of a conflagration and maybe the end of the world, that this was a very dangerous game. Um, and the rules had changed on um, August 6th and August 9th, 1945, and that we had a moral duty to bend over backwards for peace and, and take some risks for peace and avoid a kind of binary good versus evil, us versus them, black versus white reading of the international situation. Is that a, is that a fair analysis? Yes, I, I would believe that's a, that's a fair analysis of, of what happened. Um, like I said, I, I think the total underlying part of Wallace's philosophy was um, pushing for peace. No, maybe he was right. Maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe, you know, because Oppenheimer believed that the only way out of this was to tell the Soviets everything. Now that this, now that the war was over, to share data with them, he said the science can never be put back in the can anyway. That we should cooperate. That we should try to find um, uh, situations in which we could do joint projects. Uh, we should we should do everything in our power not to alarm the Soviets, but but rather to to um, ease tensions. And that if we didn't, it could be the end of the world. So he and Wallace are very much on the same page about this. But um, you know, Oppenheimer paid the ultimate price for this. He was um, discredited uh, and um, and and had his security clearance stripped, and he was disgraced uh, and. And, and had a fall, the kind of a, the fall of a tragic character that nearly killed him. So the times were not really ripe for that sort of thinking. I, I personally think that Wallace would not have been able to get very far as president, given the emergence of the Air Force, the emergence of the Cold War, uh, the hardliners like Curtis LeMay. I think that he would have made the case for a more peaceful approach, but it seems to me that the president has less unilateral power in situations like this than he would have wanted. Yeah, and I don't think that he probably would wielded he he also didn't wield the massive influence that uh franklin roosevelt did uh, a guy like Roosevelt was like way beyond anything that DC had ever seen before and could, could charm people could um, like I say play people off of each other he was he was just a huge force and anyone that was going to follow him probably didn't have that political skill and Wallace himself didn't really have a lot of political skills anyway because he didn't really bother himself much with uh, inner politicking as much as uh, the rest of the as, as the rest of uh, Washington DC did um, so yeah I, I don't know how much influence he would have had he probably would have gone to a lot of meetings and a lot of conferences overseas and, and made um, a lot of people in D.C. very uncomfortable with what he said, which was kind of later what gets him in trouble with Truman anyway. Um, but he probably would have done more of that as uh, as the president of the United States. So he's he's dumped. What does he do between 1944 and 1948? So he basically gets told, you know, that he's not going to be the uh, vice president um, and that Truman had been picked. Um, him and Truman met with each other and they were very gentlemanly 
about it. They shook hands. Um, they both said something along the lines of we're both Masons or they were both Freemasons. Um, so they were kind of like this brotherly, you know, on the level type of thing uh, within Masonry. So they kind of didn't, they didn't try to look at each other too uh, badly, at least in, in public. I'm sure they had up some choice words about each other and, and behind closed doors or with their own private thoughts. So when, when, uh, when Truman is picked uh, for vice president and, and Wallace finds this out, um, uh, Roosevelt himself uh, tells Wallace, you know, kind of like, sorry, that didn't happen the way that, you know, we thought it was going to, whether that was true or not, who knows. Um, and he says, tell your wife, don't pack her bags just yet and don't leave Washington, D.C. And he just kind of just left like, what does that mean? Uh, like, like, kind of like, if you're going to like leave the vice presidency, unless you're going to the presidency, like, what are you supposed to be doing? Um, and Truman actually ends up picking him to be a secretary of commerce, um, which is kind of an interesting, you know, way that that came about or or why. Um, but he's, cho he's chosen as secretary of commerce, which really uh, within the rankings of the uh, of the cabinet um, didn't wield a ton of, of influence at the time. Um, so Wallace stays um, as Secretary of Commerce under Truman, kind of to show face of like we're a unified body still. Um, but he then takes a trip overseas. Um, he starts uh, speaking with uh, peasantry around the world, kind of like, again, the common man. This is a theme within Wallace. Um, he again picks up where he left off, where he starts talking about peace. Uh, he talks about uh, maybe concessions with the Soviet Union, uh, working together. You had brought up Oppenheimer. It also was in in, in the same of th the same realm of thinking that you share the information about the atomic bomb with the with the Soviet Union. He probably knew, like we said earlier, he actually knew about what was going on uh, with the Manhattan Project. So he probably knew um, where the rest of the world was standing with that, um, and that you know the Soviet Union didn't. You know they they thought that if you could share that, you know you could prevent you could have more uh, peaceful ties. This wildly upsets uh, Truman. Just kind of an overstepping, um, and he asked for uh, uh, Wallace's uh, resignation, which he gladly gives um, to Truman. Um, and then he leaves um, leaves office, and people kind of think that he possibly might just be done with politics. He might mount a uh, a, a challenge to Truman with uh, the Democratic nomination in the next election. Um, but he does something very curious um, in that he runs for a third party under the Progressive Party, which is kind of built around his candidacy um, and kind of the likes of, of one of his own political heroes, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who had done the same thing. All right. So he's um, kept on by Truman, but fired by Truman when he oversteps, when he gets out of sync with Truman's foreign policy. He's probably bitter by now, decides to stand for the presidency himself in 1948. Thomas Dewey is the Republican nominee. Truman very much wants to be elected in his own right. He is nominated by the Democratic Party, and so it looks like a Truman v. Dewey race. But uh, Dewey was a kind of a moderate, almost a liberal himself, and Truman certainly had become a liberal president to the surprise of many of his Midwestern friends. There's not a lot of oxygen left in the race here, uh, but uh, Henry Wallace decides to stand as an independent for the presidency. All right, uh, was there any chance that he could win? So why did he do it? Why did he do it? I mean, this is a, you're going to humiliate yourself, exhaust yourself, annoy a lot of people, and probably not move the needle on the national political debate. So uh, Wallace probably chose to do this just in the same realm that most people choose to tend to run uh, for a third party, unless, like we just said with Roosevelt, who probably did believe possibly that he could win. His, his own ego probably thought that he could win. Uh, Wallace probably had no intention of actually probably winning. Um, he hoped to influence uh, his, uh, his, his own view of the world, stay with Within uh, the the conversation, and Wallace uh, chooses uh, in in the Progressive Party as his running mate, Glenn Taylor, uh, the singing cowboy from Idaho. Um, it was another probably I think probably the most left wing uh, member of the Senate at the time. Um, chooses him to be his running mate. Um, they go all over the United States, and to his credit, he takes um, a very controversial uh, stand uh, or platform to a lot of places that don't receive him well. Like he, as you said, like I said. Um, this is 48. This is uh, the Dixiecrat Party, um, which actually does, I believe, pick up quite a few precincts in the South. Um, Wallace goes right to the, the steps of, of, of the Southern United States and, and promotes uh, racial uh, equality, um, more women's rights, um, a way more progressive platform uh, than probably anyone was more comfortable with uh, with saying it within the two-party system. Um, Truman also is you know, for civil rights, but maybe not. Maybe can be as vocal as someone like Wallace could be. Uh, he also uh, he, he campaigns with like farm laborers in 
in California, uh, labor movements, just way more of that kind of uh, like you would think of as kind of more aggressive uh, side of things, which obviously that's name of target. So um, be, that would be expected. Now, Jeremy, we need to take another break. A fascinating conversation about the little known but quite important political figure of the FDR, New Deal, Truman era, Henry Wallace. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to this special edition of Listening to America. So, Jeremy, uh, he runs in 1948. Everybody knows the famous uh, photograph of Truman holding up the newspaper in Chicago. Uh, Dewey defeats Truman. It was universally thought that Truman could not win election in 1948, that he it was going to be a landslide, that Dewey was going to win, uh, that uh, many people thought that Truman had had a disastrous first term filling in for FDR. But he surprisingly wins, wins big in the election of 1948, and then has a second term until um, he retired in 1952, and, and Dwight David Eisenhower becomes president. One of the things that struck me in, in my recent reading of books about this is that when Truman met Eisenhower um, in Europe during the Potsdam Conference, he said to Eisenhower, Anything you want, I'll get out of your way. You want to be the next. You want to be the president in 1948. I'll get out of the way, and he meant it. He was a very humble man at heart. Uh, so he wins, and Dewey's shocked, of course. And of course, the Dixiecrats, Strom Thurmond. There's a story and a half. Um, you know, he's talking about segregation forever, saying openly uh, racist things about African Americans, advocating perpetual segregation of the races. Didn't do very well, it turns out. So you got a bunch of different things going on in 1948, but Truman wins. So Wallace is defeated, and when you read accounts of this election, he gets, he, he seems to get, instead of realizing that he had no chance, he seems to get more shrill, more outspoken, more, um, more maybe more candidly leftist as the, as the uh, campaign goes on. What did he do after he lost so ignominiously here? Um, and I also want to t touch on that just really quick um, about why he kind of was building on this, I believe. Um, Wallace, from a very young age, uh, was introduced to uh, another uh, American uh, historical figure that I, I admire greatly. It was George Washington Carver, uh, the great scientist. Um, and Wallace actually became friends as a young boy um, living in, in Ames, Iowa, because uh, his father uh, worked at, at the university there. And uh, Carver was um, was also a student there. So he kind of like took him under his wing and really kind of, you know, showed him this kind of like this vision and kind of this philosophy that you know, that God was kind of in everything, um, kind of broke down into kind of racial barriers. Uh, Wallace, the entire Wallace family was much more uh, open-minded uh, on uh, racial issues uh, than you would have found during that period. So he carries that with him through his entire life. And also kind of that vision from his grandfather was a little more progressive thinking, um, a little more open-minded, um, and, and kind of, that kind of influences him. And I think that when you kind of come to a time when you realize that your, your days of the of the of, of politics is probably waning um you kind of can come out full strength on what you believe and i think that that's what happened uh, with wallace and especially with uh, the 48 election of kind of like kind of snubbing his nose at the democratic national convention too he was not a, a machine politics kind of guy um he was not born in that he didn't come up in politics in that way um so he didn't really care about the smoky back rooms um, he didn't smoke or drink himself i mean he was a very clean living kind of guy um which is not you know what roosevelt was that's not you know what truman was um, so I think it was a little bit of a snubbing the nose um, at the, the Democratic National uh, Convention uh, to run um, in that 48 election and really push uh, some of these issues that he, he deeply uh, believed in. When we look at these situations today, there's concern like sort of the Ralph Nader effect. Does a third party candidacy help or hurt either of the main two party candidates? Does it affect the election? Do you think that the presence of Strom Thurmond and the Dixiecrat Party, which he formed that year, or Henry Wallace uh, running as a progressive changed the outcome at all of the 1948 election? You know, I, I, I hate to speak on that too much because I don't know the numbers um, off, off the top. Um, it might have uh, had, you know, some, some effect on that. I don't know where all votes were being pulled from. You know, you have to understand, too, is this is a time when every, you know, political parties within themselves, you know, had varying degrees on who was conservative, who was more liberal. You don't really see that today. Um, so I don't know where 
where all of those were being pulled from and who was hurting who um, at, at, that, at that time. Um, so I'm not entirely sure um, like how much of an effect that actually had. I'm sure political science scientists or you know historians uh, could, could look into that and, and figure that out. Wallace has lost. He's washed up now. Um, you know, he has. In other words, he hasn't done well enough to have another shot at it in 1952 or 1956. He's done. What does he do for the rest of his life? So after the 48 election, which again, he expected to probably lose, um, he was kind of a pariah within DC circles. He had kind of used up all of his political capital um, in, in that election. Uh, most of the Democratic Party did not like him, uh, except, and when I mean that, I mean the actual establishment, maybe not individual people. Um, the Republican Party, obviously, you know, they laughed at him. Um, he was kind of mocked. He was kind of op- openly mocked in uh, newspaper articles and magazines as this uh, wide-eyed dreamer, um, kind of high-in-the-sky guy. Um, so he's he's kind of just pulverized um, through it, it, from all angles, um, which really hurt him um, personally. Personally, but he thought that it was more hurtful because it affected his family a lot. Um, he tried desperately to get ahead of any kind of rumor, which, I mean, think about how fast things move today. It would be impossible, but, you know, it moved just as fast then. It's like by the time he got his typewriter out, his, the story was around the world. Um, so he couldn't really keep ahead of anything. Um, he was painted as a socialist, as a communist, um, which, you know, I, you know, people still throw around terms that don't actually have much meaning of, of, or have an understanding of what the those terms even mean. Um, but he then does this weird thing where he turns around and kind of goes back. I mean, he's still left wing, but then he kind of becomes sympathetic to some Republican candidates. Um, he endorses um, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Um, he thought that he was a uh, an advocate more for peace. Um, I believe I don't believe he endorsed him in his, in his uh, first election, but I believe he endorsed him in his second election. Um, he became friends with uh, Richard Nixon. Wallace ends up spending the majority of the rest of his his life back where he loved the most, which was his farm. Um, he does not move back to Iowa, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, he purchased a farm in uh, upstate New York, about an hour from uh, Hyde Park, where uh, FDR's estate was at. And Roosevelt had these kind of like these dreams of that him and Wallace would uh, be kind of farmers next to each other. Um, there's kind of this interesting dichotomy of the aristocratic um, estate, family money, um, partier like FDR, and uh, a guy like a, a hard scrabbled kind of a Midwestern uh, farmer from uh, Iowa, uh, uh, Henry Wallace, kind of living kind of side by side in kind of this agrarian uh, place in New York. Obviously, FDR passes away, so that's never realized. Um, but Wallace spends the majority of the rest of his life um, in in New York. Um, he ends up breeding chickens. Um, early in his life, he had bred corn. He'd come up with hybrid corn and revolutionized uh, the corn industry, which became pioneer uh, seed. Um, but then he ends up uh, breeding chickens, which kind of highline chickens, uh, which is massively successful. I think they said like every like one out of every three eggs came from um, from the, the Wallace chicken. Um, he also bred strawberries. Um, he went back to being a scientist and kind of like a Jeffersonian in that way. Um, uh, he unfortunately is diagnosed with uh, ALS after he's hiking in a, on a pyramid in South America and feels his leg kind of give out a little bit. Gets diagnosed with ALS, which is just a horrible, horrible disease that still is today. Um, he doesn't have much longer to live. It's always a death sentence. But he even approached that in his scientific mind and, and wrote down notes about how he had felt, if anything had helped, um, kind of dedicated his body to uh, his kind of living body to science in that way um, to try to uh, kind of advance um, any kind of understanding of, of such a horrible disease. That's fascinating. So you contacted me uh, saying we should talk about Henry Wallace. Why? What What does Henry Wallace mean to you? Sure. So I came across Henry Wallace. I, I kind of knew who he was. I think everyone who studies American history has this idea that he was the guy that got done by FDR. Or maybe they know him because of the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Um, but I came across an article uh, several years ago uh, in the New Yorker uh, called The Uncommon Man. And I just loved this photo of him standing at his farm uh, in New York, uh, where he's standing in front of uh, his Jeep has a bunch of chicken grates on it. And I thought, who is this guy? And, you know, I knew he was Henry Wallace, but, you know, I was like, I guess I never even thought about, you know, reading into him. And so when I read the article, um, I just became really fascinated with his life. Um, I, myself, uh, with a history background, um, am interested in environmental history, uh, horticultural history, agriculture history. And he touches on a lot of that. Um, and then obviously I'm just also a political junkie. So it kind of 
kind of mixes those worlds um, uh, together quite nicely. And I love characters within American history that you can't put in a box easily. I'm also, I had become very interested in Theodore Roosevelt, but then after reading Douglas, Douglas Brinkley's uh, book on Franklin Roosevelt about his uh, conservation efforts, I started thinking a whole different way. And then Wallace kind of bounced back through that way through Roosevelt. So it's just kind of a fascinating uh, topic. And just like with a lot of other uh, characters, just like with you, with uh, Thomas Jefferson is like, you can go so many different ways with Wallace. We kind of talk more about his political career, but his his career as a scientist, and uh, which he liked more than anything, and uh, is is also very fascinating. First, I'm a little surprised that anyone in Western Kansas reads The New Yorker. I'm, I congratulate you for that. What should we read? What's a good biography of Wallace? So the most complete uh, biography um, is American Dreamer, uh, A Life of Henry A. Wallace by John C. Culver and John Hyde. It kind of shows a, a very favorable view of, of, uh, of Henry Wallace, or but that's definitely the most uh, complete book by by, um, Henry Wallace, um, but Henry Wallace himself was a writer. Um, he uh, wrote several articles um, in, within his own uh, newspaper. Um, but he had he ended up writing a book on the history of corn. Um, he's you know we didn't really get much into that on this, but he he's the corn guy. Like he you know he, he even thought the national symbol shouldn't have been an eagle. He thought it should have been corn. No, I'm so glad that didn't happen. Say again, American Dreamer. Who are the two authors? It's uh, John C. Culver and John Hyde. All right. So do you think history has been unfair to Henry Wallace? I mean, he's essentially forgotten. If I, if you went out tonight to all the restaurants in Hayes and and asked everyone you met who was Henry Wallace, uh, you wouldn't get much response. I don't think. Not even like he wasn't. Didn't he have a relationship in some sense with FDR? I don't even think that would be the case. So he's basically forgotten. It seems like that um, he and FDR were simpatico, that the, the FDR was a liberal, at a times a radical liberal, and Wallace was sort of a, a more pure embodiment of that politics, um, but that FDR was not paying attention by 1944, and he let this thing happen. Um, so it is what it is. I'm a big fan of, of Harry S. Truman, so I like the fact that he was a, an unusual and accidental president. But do you think that that the Democrats and the American political system failed to understand the greatness of this man? I believe so. Um, I think it's interesting you brought up, you know, if I went in and pulled, you know, 20 people who Henry Wallace was like, I mean, I would maybe get like one or two people. I mean, you'd have to be kind of a political junkie, uh, American history junkie to kind of understand who he is. But being here in Western Kansas, I can say, do you know what Pioneer Seed is? And of course, everybody knows. And, and Henry Wallace is the founder of that company. So Sure, but nobody says, oh, Pioneer Seed. Yeah, that wasn't that Henry Wallace yeah, who did that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and his family is, you know, probably benefited very well from <laughs> from that company. Um, but no, I, a lot of people don't know who Henry Wallace was. And and when you read about him, you know, if you were do a Google search, it's like, oh, yeah, he was just kind of this weird, um, you know, he was into kind of religion. He kind of had this controversy. He had this connection with, with Roosevelt. Could have been president, but he wasn't. Um, I think more people, I, I've, I've kind of followed kind of a trend of, of kind of seeing if, if any other articles have popped up over time. And I feel like more people have paid attention to, to Wallace over the years, but I definitely don't feel like he's a, a still a common name at all, um, but had a huge impact um, on, on our a political system and with him being secretary of agriculture he massively affected family farms um, that are probably uh, still feeling those repercussions a little bit today you mentioned his religion say a little bit more about that as we close today yeah so that, so his religious uh, background is is what could be a whole book probably in itself um so his father was a presbyterian minister but after his grandfather passes away um he that connection to uh, the presbyterian church kind of is severed um, and he goes on this whole wild um, throughout his entire life, this wild uh, uh, searching for you know religious truth. He was very much a deeply religious person, whatever that meant to him or, or how people saw it. But he, he was he, he believed very much in in, uh, in God, God being kind of in everything, kind of a mystic view of of the of the universe. Um, he dabbled in like uh, Native American uh, religion. Um, he I think at one point thought or it was told you know by some kind of an indigenous leader that he was part of a tribe in a past life. Um, he dabbled with Zoroastrianism, um, but within a mainstream 
Eastern Christianity. Um, he eventually joined the Episcopal Church, but before that, um, he had uh, founded the liberal Catholic Church, not connected to the Roman Catholic Church um, in Des Moines. So he was kind of all over the place, um, especially for a guy of his time. And kind of, I always say that he's sort of like a Jeffersonian type guy um, with a scientific part, but definitely not a Jeffersonian probably when it comes to religious beliefs. Um, I'd imagine Thomas Jefferson would have enjoyed uh, learning about his uh, concepts of, of genetics and plant breeding, but probably would have scoffed at his uh, view of the religious world. As many did. I mean, he was seen as a religious whack job by a lot of people. And that hurt him in the 1948 election, among other things. It's, we need to remember how conservative the country was, uh, small c conservative in, in the 1940s and 50s, that uh, there may have been liberals, but um, it was a, a time of sort of um, old style mainline Christianity, some of which still um, reigns supreme in, in, in Western Kansas, but less so perhaps in, in other parts of the world. He's a fascinating figure, a kind of a Renaissance man, uh, if, if FDR had been younger and stronger, um, if the country had been less um, susceptible to the Cold War mania, uh, Henry Wallace might indeed have gone on to a bigger political career, might have been the president of the United States. It's interesting to speculate on what that might have been. But as things are... He led a distinguished life. Did he end, do you think, in happiness or in bitterness? You know, I think that Wallace took life like any other scientific experiment. And I think that he looked at that, you know, that was an experiment that he kind of rolled the dice with. Um, his grandfather didn't want to be involved in politics, but his father kind of reluctantly took um, the reins of politics of this kind of your duty of being uh, thrown into the ring if you needed to be. And so I think Wallace always kind of, I think he didn't necessarily want to be subjugated to politics, but kind of like the world thrust it upon him. Um, but I think that he probably, prior to him getting obviously very sick, I think he was probably very much enjoying what he was doing in New York with uh, with his farm. Um, he, you know, it's, it's interesting to talk about kind of an agrarian streak of, of, of him throughout his entire life. Um, and, and one tid tidbit that I know that you'll really enjoy is that Wallace, um, he had a family member that was connected. I, th I think it was a family member. It might have been a friend or something like that. Um, had a connection with the Swiss embassy in, in Washington, D.C. And they had kind of worked up a deal that he could uh, uh, use a plot of land in D.C. Um, for a victory garden. And, and Wallace would go out as vice president and work in his garden in the morning. And that's how he kind of just stayed in touch with the common man. And people would come by and talk with him and not even have a clue that he was the vice president of the United States, which you could never imagine today. Um, one guy eventually came by and said, you know, like, I'd heard that you're the vice president. And he said, kind of like laughed and was like, yeah, I guess I am. And he's like, but look at my tomatoes over here. And and so they just talked about that instead. It had nothing to do with anything. And if, especially this would have been like a massive, you would, would think a national security risk, you know, being during World War II. But, uh, but I think that he he carried that humbleness and that, that agrarian thing all through his life. So I think he adapted that into his uh, political retirement. And I think he was probably a little bit embittered of, of watching things unfold um, in, in kind of the post-war era that he probably would have done differently uh, and probably criticized Truman um, in private. Uh, but I, I think that he was probably uh, back to where he wanted to be most of all, and that was with his hands on the soil. Last question. You know, FDR started the Soil Conservation Service, and I've read a couple of times in a couple of places that he actually had an idea to plant a shelter belt from the Canadian border to the bottom of Texas in a single line, that it was going to be a maybe 100 miles wide, it was going to be wide, but it was going to be this like linear shelter belt all the way from the top to all the way to the bottom. That didn't happen. I wish it had. It would have been a great thing. Uh, did Wallace have any role in this crazy idea? So I, I guess I don't I don't remember right off the top of my head about that particular project, but I do know that Wallace um, was an advocate for uh, shelter belts, um, uh, planting trees along the Midwest to kind of uh, mitigate the, the, uh, the man-made disaster that was the Dust Bowl. Um, so I mean, maybe you know a little bit more about that particular project. Project, um, but I, I, I don't have that on top of my head, but that does seem like something that would be of his interest. You know, it's a sad thing that the shelter belts have reached their um, lifespan um, in North Dakota and they're being bulldozed now because and not being replanted because we think we've overcome that with no-till and so on. But I hate to see them being bulldozed down and burned because they represent one of the noblest things that the USDA, one of the noblest things that the USDA ever did. Yeah, you can kind of see the the ghost of that that past of here in Western Kansas as well of, of, of uh, old trees that that have died now or places that I even knew that were there. You know, my you know life. Uh, yeah, it would have been very interesting to see if they would have planted it and how much would have existed. Um, you know, there was kind of a far-reaching idea of planting a, a national forest in Southwest Kansas as well that didn't go <laughs> accordingly. But 
There is one in Nebraska, so you know we it's yeah, the, that legacy continues. Jeremy Gill, thank you so much. I appreciate your contacting me about this. You've been really interesting on the question of Henry Wallace. And to all of you, we'll see you next week for another important edition of Listening to America.